okay, 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 it's enough, it's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Jeremy. Don't get jealous, don't get jealous. Uncle Jeremy is coming to He's like, why are you calling your Uncle Jeremy? <laughs> your Jeremy, call me to all of them. I've claimed you now. We as Nigerians, we've named you. We take you into our family. And Auntie's the background too. Auntie's always amazing. But give some love for the man who constantly fights, constantly puts young people's voices in the front, constantly tells the truth, and yet gets demonized by the media. So when I say free, you say the press. Free. Free. When I say free, you say the press. Free. Free. Give some love for Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, thank you all for being here today and thank you to all those that have organised not just this event but so many others all around the country and thank you to those that organised events this morning in solidarity with those refugees who were stuck on the border between Belarus and Poland dying in plain sight of the media in plain sight of food and water they can't get. Isn't that the most disgusting view of the way in which the world treats so many refugees with such inhumanity? Now I want to say a big thank you again to all of you for being here today and for the speeches that I've heard since I came from Natalie, from Assad and from Ben and others and they've all made a very strong case. Now, um, I could probably write the headlines in the media tomorrow. Um, well, they'll get confused about the numbers. Either there's 200 people here, or there's 2,000, or there's 20,000, or whatever number you care to choose, but it won't be the one the BBC reports, whatever that is. Um, and they're gonna say, irresponsible protesters blocked Parliament Square. Well, and down the road there's um, Party Central just over there where um, behind, behind the walls. But when the media decide to concentrate solely on one aspect of the government's behaviour and the Prime Minister's conduct, you ask yourself some questions. I'm not condoning anything that Johnson has done and I'm not condoning the massive amounts of money that have been poured into dodgy companies during Covid but I am supporting the health workers who've done so much to try and keep us safe during Covid. But my objection to Boris Johnson and his government is yes his behaviour but actually what's far far more serious is the amount of money that's been poured into failed track and trace systems, the way in which we're paying through the nose for vaccines that we paid for, for the research to be done, the way in which the private sector is uh, being empowered, emboldened to take over our national health service, and the ignorance of the way in which the regulations have have acted out against people, particularly causing so much mental health stress. What I'd also criticise this government for is the whole agenda behind Johnson. Now it's very easy, and I've seen lots of memes and lots of films, and some are very funny about Johnson's behaviour and all the rest of it. But don't run away with the idea, just because you don't agree with or don't like somebody, that they're actually stupid or doing something from some uh, for, through ignorance. No, they're not. There is a whole agenda here. And it's a, an agenda about disempowering people, empowering authority in the state, at the same time as a massive, and it is a massive, redistribution of wealth and power in favor of the powerful and the wealthiest. 
Over the past two years, the people that have become the wealthiest are the billionaires and the trillionaires and the mega trillionaires. It's Amazon, it's Facebook, it's Google. It is all those distribution companies around the world. It's property speculation. It's all of those. And who's become worse off? Working class communities all over this country. Working class communities in the USA and here. And the poorest people in the poorest countries that receive the least health care and the worst, the worst allocation of funds internationally for development purposes. It is a massive power grab by the richest and most powerful, not just in this country, but on a global scale. So bear that in mind when you look at the legislation that is now before Parliament. The Borders and Nationality Bill, for example. The Borders and Nationality Bill, which seeks to criminalise, yes, criminalise, what doing what every single one of us in this square would do, that is saving life of somebody at risk at sea. The law of the sea is there for a purpose. It requires, requires every person who is a seafarer to do everything they can to save life. This government criminalizes people for trying to help refugees who are drowning in the English Channel. That is the depths to which they have sunk. And then the idea of removing nationality, the passport of anyone who may, may be eligible to apply for nationality somewhere else through one of their parents, as Ben was pointing out. That affects several million people in this country. So if the Home Secretary or any Home Secretary uses that power to remove nationality from somebody, there is no guarantee that some other country is going to offer them nationality. You might ask the question, why should they? And so we have the power given by Parliament to the Home Secretary to render several hundred thousand, if not millions of people, potentially stateless as a result of that. That is an unbelievably draconian power, which obviously has to be opposed. And the bill that brought most of you here today, I would imagine, is the police bill. And Natalie described very well the battle that she and other comrades, and there are some comrades in the House of Lords who are doing their best on this. But she knows, I know, you know, this bill is only going to be defeated by mass action all over the country and an, and an understanding of what it means. Because if the right to protest is res restricted, if you have to seek police permission to do anything, well, where does that lead to? It leads to every protest becoming a conflict about having the protest rather than what the protest is about. It effectively disempowers us all, puts us all on the back foot, and puts us all in a totally defensive mode. So, we defend our NHS because we love our NHS, even though we know it's underfunded and under threat of privatization. We defend the principle of local government services for the same reason. So we end up endlessly defending things instead of demanding things. And so, yes, like everyone here, I will defend the National Health Service, but I also want us to have a national care service so that we don't go through the pain of seeing our loved ones not properly cared for and I want it publicly run, publicly owned and publicly accountable so that the staff are properly paid. And when I object to water companies discharging raw sewage into our rivers, which they did 400,000 times in England, I don't want to regulate the water companies, 
I want to shut them down and bring water back into public ownership. Accountable, democratic public ownership where we all have a say. And I'm getting a big look and a big stare at the minute from Auntie here. Touché. So I will just finish with this. As I said, this disempowers, and there's so many other things to talk about, public ownership, rights at work, decent wages, decent conditions. But I say this, it's all about our own empowerment. It's getting young people to join a trade union, however insecure their work is. It's getting people organized together. But this sense of disempowerment is designed to have a depressive effect, particularly on young people. Young people get a hard time. Over-tested, over-pressurized in school. Over-inspected, over-stressed in many ways. The mental health problems, particularly amongst secondary school and college students, is serious, and that comes about from that. And then, on leaving school, Choices emerge for young people. Go to college, go to uni if you can get in, get an apprenticeship if you can get one, try and get a job. Insecure work, low pay, massive debt if you go to uni, massive debt that will follow you for a very long time as that uncollectible debt is sold to debt collectors who will harass people for the rest of their lives trying to get that money out of them. And then, move on, want somewhere to live, council housing insufficient, purchasing impossible, private rented sector the only option, expensive, badly maintained, under-regulated, insecure. And so young people are faced with this prospect that somehow or other everything they get and do is less good or worse than their parents or their grandparents' generation. I want us to be strong and thoughtful and confident enough to recognize that all over the world, young people have all the hopes, the enthusiasm, the imagination, the art, the music, the ideas, the science, the maths, and all the other things. They have that sense of determination, and they do not want to live in a divided, racist society. They support Black Lives Matters because it challenges that colonial history. They do not want to live in a world where we're perpetually about to go to war with somebody for something or other. Instead, they want to live in a world of peace where those resources can go for education, for health, for housing, for environment and sustainability, rather than war. And so, I finished because I've got a real serious look from Auntie down here. And I just finished by this, saying this. Thank you, because a protest, a demonstration, gives people hope, gives people an opportunity, and gives us, gives us that dream of what a better world will be. This square, this place, has been the centre of protest. The suffragettes were here, the chartists were here, and so many others were here. They're the ones that gave us what we've got. It's up to us to give the next generation what they haven't yet got, what we haven't got, but what we want them to have. Thank you very much. <laughs>